Hi everyone, my name is Chloe Legendre. I'm a research scientist at Netflix. Today I'm going to be talking about multispectral lighting reproduction for virtual production. Now before I get started, some of the content I'll cover in this course was completed during my time at USC's Institute for Creative Technologies, while some was completed more recently while working at Netflix. This lecture is part of a broader SIGGRAPH 2022 course titled Practical Aspects of Spectral Data in Digital Content Production. And now, of course, when we think about spectral data being used for content production, we're usually thinking about this in the context of using a rendering engine. But in what I'll talk about today, which is virtual production, the world acts as our spectral renderer. The kind of virtual production I'm going to talk about is when you surround actors with light sources representing the illumination of either a real world or a virtual scene. Here we see a modern example of the technique being used to produce the new Netflix show 1899 on the set of the Dark Bay facility. We have here a combination of LED panels arranged in an arc as well as other light sources on the ceiling that surround both the actors as well as the physical set from all directions. Now there are three main benefits to filming in such a virtual production stage. Um, you may also hear these referred to as LED volumes. First, you can film what's called an in-camera background. In this scenario, the LED panels replace the need for a green screen, and so the LED pixels, they display the background content, and they're directly recorded by the motion picture camera, as you can see in this example. And this removes the need for post-production matting techniques like chroma keying, rotoscoping, or more generally just compositing. Next, the actors, while still performing inside a studio, they get the opportunity to perform in an environment that resembles the real world. This has the potential to enhance their performances and even to provide consistent eye lines for different actors. But finally, the main advantage, and the one that we're going to be focused on today, is lighting reproduction, where the illumination on the actors matches that of a real world or virtual environment, and you're using the LED stage to directly reproduce a scene's lighting. In the original image that I showed here, you can see the virtual production stage producing kind of a cloudy daytime environment with relatively diffuse lighting from above. Although this version of lighting reproduction leverages both LED panels as well as other cinema light sources, at SIGGRAPH in 2002, Debevic et al. introduced a first lighting reproduction solution where an actor was surrounded by a sphere of computer-controllable red, green, and blue LEDs. These LEDs were driven using RGB colors of photographed high dynamic range lighting, or by using the light from a virtual set, enabling seamless integration with computer-generated scenes. Since its introduction, the technique was applied in many movies including in Gravity, where actors were surrounded by a whole box of RGB LED panels that displayed pre-computed dynamic lighting from virtual scenes that were used to light the actors. And this was kind of the predecessor to today's LED panel-based approaches. It was also used in Rogue One, where HDR virtual lighting environments were displayed on LED panels to light real actors inside this constructed ship cockpit. Now, with travel restrictions in place due to the COVID-19 pandemic, Many other examples of film and TV using this technique have since emerged, and this is nowhere near a complete list of projects that use the methodology. However, in each of these projects, they all used only red, green, and blue LEDs. Now, we know this already for the light stage version, but if you look very closely at an LED panel that's used in typical virtual production stages, you're going to see individual pixels represented by single red, green, and blue LED units as we can see in this close-up photograph here. And since your panels are RGB and your photographed or your rendered lighting environment is also RGB, then you can just drive the LEDs of your light source with the pixel colors of your lighting image, possibly first after applying a three by three color matrix. And this works reasonably well in practice because RGB LEDs can produce light of almost every human observable color. But the problem that we're going to talk about today is that they can't produce light of any spectrum. RGB LEDs unfortunately have relatively peaky emission spectra, as we can see here for each of the red, green, and blue LEDs for a given pixel. And although this isn't an issue when we're using these LEDs as a display, we have to think about what happens when we want to use the LED panels as light sources. In 2003, Wenger et al. tried to use RGB LEDs to reproduce the spectrum of real-world illuminance, like an incandescent and tungsten source, which has a spectrum that looks something like this. Now, unfortunately, you can't match this spectrum exactly using just RGB LEDs because you can't combine these three spectral peaks to match this spectrum of tungsten. 
Now to visualize what this meant for color rendition, Wenker et al. demonstrated that trying to match both a tungsten and fluorescent at light source using only RGB lighting didn't work very well in practice. So in this image, the subject is lit from image left with a tungsten bulb and image right with a fluorescent bulb. And this second image here shows a reproduction of the illumination using RGB LEDs, where the goal here was to match the spectra in a least square sense. And we can see that this really didn't go very well. Wenger et al. also tried to match the color of the lighting rather than the spectrum. And while the results look overall better, the colors still don't match here. This is most obvious for the denim jacket, but it's also true of the skin tones as well if you look closely. Now what's happening here, and this is really a key point for the course today, is that the world is acting as a spectral renderer. Pixel values are produced by integrating over all wavelengths a fully spectral modulation of a scene illuminant by the reflectance of the material being illuminated. In this case, we're looking at a reflectance spectrum for skin. This is integrated against the camera spectral response for each color channel. And with LED reproduced illumination, the colors are going to be different whether we try to match the spectrum or the color of the original illuminant. It's really these spectral mismatches that matter for color rendition, particularly the dip between the green and the red LEDs at about 550 to 600 nanometers is especially problematic. This does matter when we're looking at skin tones, but it especially matters when we're looking at yellow and orange materials. We're totally missing energy in this yellow part of the spectrum. And the result is that yellow materials often disappear when they're illuminated within, within virtual production stages. The image here on the left shows Paul in his Hawaiian shirt under a broad spectrum warm white LED. And on the right, we can see the appearance of the shirt under an RGB LED virtual production stage that's trying to reproduce this illumination. In this case, we've matched the color of the light, and so the white balance here is the same. So Wenger et al. in 2003, they thought about adding LEDs to fill in these spectral gaps for an individual light source. Now fortunately, other, other LEDs besides RGB are available, and Wenger et al. built a nine-channel light source out of color kinetics lights in order to compare with RGB LED lighting when used for lighting reproduction. Now notably, in order to achieve these kind of yellow colored sources that you can see in the image here, they had to place yellowish gel filters over white LEDs. And although lots of different LEDs of distinct spectra are available, kind of making these yellow looking LED um, lights uh, emitting light around the 550 nanometer re region was difficult then, and indeed it's still difficult today, which we'll see later. Now to figure out how to best drive these LEDs to reproduce a light source, Wenger et al. introduced three approaches that were all based on spectral measurements. We already saw the first two, um, but I'll summarize them. First, in what they call spectral illuminant matching, they minimize spectral error directly for a target illuminant. Next, in what they called metameric illuminant matching, they tried to match the color of the target illuminant, which requires a specific observer or camera because color is in the eye of the beholder. Now, the target and the reproduced illuminants here are called metamers. In color science, this refers to two colors that appear the same despite having different spectra. And we saw results on previous slides that were using these two techniques. But finally, in the third technique that they introduced called metameric reflectance matching, they tried to match the color for a whole set of materials lit by the target illuminant, and this of course also required an observer. When trying to reproduce illumination using LEDs, for all three spectral matching methods that they introduced, the nine channel lighting that you see here on the top vastly improved the color rendition compared with the RGB lighting alone that you see on the bottom. Now we should note that Wenger et al. here used spectral measurements for each part of the system in order to achieve the results. This was a great proof of concept for improving color rendition using a multispectral light source, expanding upon using RGB-only LEDs. However, this test covered only single light sources, and for lighting reproduction and virtual production more generally, we'd ideally like to get this benefit from all incident lighting directions. In fact, even to generate these figures, the subject had to stand very still while a light source was manually repositioned to her left or right. With this in mind, at USC ICT, we built a fully omnidirectional multispectral light stage. 
And you can see it here. Uh, we're peering into the stage here using a wide angle lens. This stage added amber, cyan, as well as broad spectrum white LEDs to the original red, green, and blue of a lighting reproduction system to try to fill in these spectral gaps inspired by Wenger et al. And the spectra for these new LEDs are shown here. So each one of these hexagonal stars that you can see in the cluster is a custom built circuit board that was used to drive the different channels of LEDs. Now at work that we presented at SIGGRAPH in 2016, we tried to answer the following question. How does one drive multispectral lights to replicate real world lighting? And in particular, how does one use three channel RGB light probes to drive multispectral lights that have six or even more spectral channels? So in the most kind of straightforward approach, we could just point a spectral radiometer, which is a spectral, measuring device, spectral measurement device, in every direction for which we have a light source inside the light stage. And then we could imagine just mixing the LEDs to best match this measured illumination spectrum. And this would essentially be borrowing the spectral illuminant matching technique introduced by Wenger et al. 2003. However, this process would be slow and cumbersome. So instead, we thought about another way that photographers capture color rendition, and this is by photographing a color chart. In the color chart, each chart square has its own unique reflectance spectrum that tells us something different about the spectrum of the scene's lighting. So in our approach, we're going to directly solve for how to drive the multispectral LEDs of our light stage to match a given color chart's appearance. Take as an example a color chart that's lit by a particular target illuminant, say tungsten. What we do is we first photograph the chart lit by the red, the green, the blue, the cyan, the amber, and the white LEDs inside our light stage. And now we know that any color chart that's going to be illuminated by a light source in the light stage is going to have to be a linear combination of these six images because light is additive. So what we can do is just solve for the amount of each image to add together to produce the appearance of the chart lit by tungsten. And then this corresponds to the intensities that we use to drive each LED. Now we're happy because this technique doesn't require any spectral measurements. So it's actually the same process as the metameric reflectance matching technique of Wenger et al. 2003, but with no spectral radiometer required. At this point though, we need to think about how do we use this step or this process for every light in the light stage for the whole sphere of lighting directions. So in this work, we introduced the idea of a color chart panorama, which is a record of the color rendition properties for each direction in a given scene. We also introduced two capture techniques to measure this information. In the faster technique, we photographed an arrangement of two reflective spheres and five color charts facing in different directions using multiple exposures. The chrome ball here on the left records the color of the incident's illumination from every direction, and the black sphere on the right gives an image of the environment about four and a half star stops darker if we want to shoot HDR video. The five color charts in the center yield low angular resolution spectral detail of the illumination. I'm going to skip the data processing technique and move straight to results where we capture lighting using this system and then we play it back inside the multispectral light stage in order to light a subject. Now in the images that follow, we've applied no image specific color correction. These are just results uh, coming in camera, just converted to sRGB only for display. So what we've done is we first photographed our multispectral light probe and two friends of our lab, Janetta on the top and Jessica on the bottom, in a real mixed illumination environment. We then reproduced the illumination inside the light stage using six spectral channels and we observed close visual matches. We also observed close visual matches using only RGB and white LEDs. However, when we use RGB only lighting, the skin tones appear the wrong color. They look overly saturated and they look hue shifted, consistent with what, has, with what has been observed in contemporary virtual production stages. We also captured a lighting environment outdoors that included direct sunlight, photographing Janetta and Jessica here again as well. We produced close matches using six channel lighting in the light stage and even four channel lighting using RGB and white LEDs, which might be acceptable for many applications. And once again, RGB only lighting leads to color rendition challenges, especially for the skin tone of Janetta in the top row. If we look at a color chart, we see the same pattern. 
Here, what we've done is we've sampled pixel values from photos of color charts lit by three real illuminants, tungsten, fluorescent, and daylight. And then we photographed color charts lit by the LED reproduced illumination for different combinations of LEDs. When the dots, which are the LED sampled values, when those fade into the background, it means we've achieved a very close visual match. So here we can see that using six LEDs gives the best color rendition. However, using RGB plus white already looks significantly better than using RGB alone. Now, the relative success of the RGB white LED mix here brings up the next question, which is what's actually an, an optimal LED selection for lighting reproduction? How many spectral channels do we really need for color accurate lighting reproduction? Instead of six, can we use five? Can we use four? Um, you know, how many spectral channels do we need? Is there any point in adding any more? So our intuition tells us that adding more types of LEDs with different spectra is gonna improve our ability to reproduce different illuminants, but we don't really know if this is true. Furthermore, which LEDs should we choose? Which ones are gonna be the most useful? In our light stage that we just showed, as well as in the nine channel light made by Wenger et al., the selections were just made based on the heuristic that we wanted to cover the most, most of the visible light spectrum. But is there a better combination? So the answer to answer these questions, um, if we answer these questions, there's an applicability, of course, in light stage type system design, but also more generally for studio lighting design and any color sensitive imaging workflows like archiving and cultural heritage preservation, for instance. So fortunately, in the time since Wenger et al was published with their nine channel light, um, there are newer LEDs of unique spectra that are available. And in particular, you can find LEDs of the colors lime and PC amber, which stands for phosphor converted amber. Uh, similar to white LEDs, these use royal blue emitters that have emission, emission broadening phosphors in front of them. But unlike white LEDs, these new colors, the lime and PC amber, have essentially none of the blue emitter output remaining. And although they do fill in the spectral gaps in the kind of yellow green region, if we look at their relative energy output compared with other colors of LEDs, we can see that they're still fairly dim and they have broader emission spectra as well. So in total, there are about 11 different LEDs of distinct spectra that are available. They have emission spectra similar to those that you can see here. And there are some slight adjustments and there are more that are in the IR range, but this is kind of the ones that span the visible spectrum. Now for our optimal LED selection, we're interested in using these LEDs as sets, say of four, five, six, or maybe even all 11 of these available LEDs, for instance. And so there's a lot of possible combinations here. So if we're gonna look for four sets of LEDs, then we have 330 options. If we're gonna look for five LEDs, then we've got 462 options, etc. So our goal again is to be able to reproduce certain common illuminants inside a lighting reproduction system. And so we wanted to consider some standard illuminants like tungsten, daylight, skylight, which is the sky without the sun, as well as a fluorescent spectrum, sort of some logical choices. However, light sources and lighting reproduction systems are often responsible for reproducing indirect illumination as well, such as sunlight bounced off of sand or greenery. And so we, we also considered here sunlight as modulated by the reflectance spectra of grass and of sand, um, which are important because of their prevalence in natural scenes. So here, what we're gonna do is look at color charts generated for a standard observer for each of these six kind of test illuminants. And again, the background squares are gonna represent the color chart seen under the true illuminant and the foreground dots represent the best lighting reproduction result for the specific LED combination. And so you can see first the results for the RGB only LEDs. And as we expect, they're not very good. Next, we can add the white LED. Uh, the fluorescent and the tungsten here are particularly challenging to reproduce, but the others are starting to look okay. If we add the PC amber, the phosphor converted amber, uh, the dots are barely observable at all. And finally, here's the results of using all 11 LEDs of distinct spectra. And there's almost no perceivable difference between using all 11 and using five LEDs. Uh, so to summarize, we see that we get very little improvement when we use more than five spectral channels in a lighting reproduction system. And this kind of goes against our intuition that just continually adding more spectral channels is going to improve our color rendition capability. We also found that our optimal light source should include RGB white and PC amber LEDs. 
this combination ended up as the winner when we considered all the different error metrics introduced by Wenger et al. for the human observer, for different cameras, looking at uh, the color chart spectra, looking at skin tone spectra as well. Now, if we wanted to add a sixth LED, we found it should be either lime or cyan. So we made a plan to incorporate the results of this analysis into our next generation light stage designs. And in particular, USC ICT designed and built a multispectral lighting reproduction rig for SUVI, who are a Beijing-based media production company. The SUVI light stage was the first eight meter dome designed specifically for lighting reproduction. The light sources are similar to those in the multispectral ICT light stage that I showed earlier, except that our previous work informed the swap from kind of a narrow band amber to the broad spectrum PC amber that I showed the spectrum of before. And in addition to the dome lights that we've seen before, uh, this light stage also has a light up floor. And you can see the floor here lighting up in different colors looking through a fisheye lens here. So although we're very thrilled to have been able to build this multispectral light stage for lighting reproduction, in the years since its construction, we've seen a huge increase in virtual production just using RGB LED panels. And so understanding that this is kind of the state of the world today in virtual production, when we got to Netflix, we wanted to ask, how can we improve color rendition when we are using just RGB LEDs? So let's assume that we're gonna leave the hardware the same. Now, if we time travel back to SIGGRAPH in 2016, when I first presented our work on the multispectral light stage, a very astute audience member who will go unnamed asked me, well, what if you allow for post corrections? Will that help improve color rendition when using only RGB LEDs? Unfortunately, at the time, we had thought about this ahead of time and we had come prepared with this visual answer. Compared with using RGB LEDs to reproduce common real world illuminance, applying a color correction transform in the form of a three by three matrix does allow you to improve the color rendition. Here again, the foreground dots are colors sampled under a reproduction of the illumination shown over the background squares, which are the colors under the real world illuminance. Now we see this improvement uh, using this three by three post correction matrix, which you see in the second row here on the slide. If we compare this, however, with a fully multispectral approach, we do see that this post correction matrix result is not quite as effective. But nonetheless, this post correction matrix idea did help. So this inspired our latest work at Netflix, which we'll be presenting this year at the DigiPro Symposium that's co-located with SIGGRAPH. So to start, we need to consider what people are doing now to calibrate their virtual production stages, specifically looking at color. So the first thing that they do is they typically ensure linearity. So a pixel value that's twice as bright as another produces twice as much light when both are displayed on the same panels. Now the next thing that you might do is to measure the LED primaries as they're seen by your camera and make sure that a red pixel value in the content that's displayed by the panel looks red to the motion picture camera and then the same thing holds true for green and blue. Now this is typically achieved by generating a three by three color calibration matrix that we'll call M as in Mary, whose job it is to make sure that a primary displayed by the panel actually looks that color to the camera. In practice, this three by three color matrix is applied to the content before it's displayed by the panels. And so we can think of it as sort of a pre-correction matrix. Now, the nice part about this process is that if red, green, and blue look correct to the camera, then all the other colors in the content, including white, will look correct as well because they're all linear combinations of the primaries. So this process is great and it works very well if your goal is to make in-camera backgrounds look correct. But what about our post-correction matrix now? So if we apply a post-correction matrix Q to the final image, let's say it's a three by three matrix, although the foreground content will be a closer color match, the calibrated in-camera background that we just spent this time calibrating the primaries for will no longer appear correct. Now, we could imagine a world where we first perform a foreground background segmentation and then we apply our post-correction matrix Q only to foreground pixels. But this really defeats the purpose of virtual production where we're trying to avoid segmentation in favor of filming the background directly in camera and not needing to do any matting. So our key insight in this new project is that 
we can apply a different panel calibration matrix to pixels that will be observed directly by the camera, treating in-frustum pixels differently from out-of-frustum pixels. Since most virtual production stages already leverage camera tracking for parallax adjustments, this is straightforward to implement because you can already separate in-frustum and out-of-frustum content. So instead of applying our original color calibration matrix M, as in Mary, to in-camera frustum pixels, we're going to apply the matrix N, as in norm, which is the original calibration matrix multiplied by the inverse of the post-correction matrix Q, which you can see the formula for on the slide. If we know Q in advance, then we can solve for N, as in norm. And because the background pixels don't contribute very much towards the actual lighting on the actors, now both the foreground color rendition as well as the appearance of the in-camera background are going to be near optimal. That was a big wall of text. So to visually summarize the approach, instead of using this wall of text, we have three matrices now in our pipeline. Matrix M, as in Mary, transforms the pixel values of the content to values that are going to be shown on the LED panels outside the camera frustum. This is the same matrix that's used by today's in-camera VFX calibration workflows, so the primary based method I showed before. Matrix N, as in norm, transforms pixel values of the content to pixel values shown on the LED panels inside the camera frustum. And finally, the matrix Q transforms pixels recorded by the studio camera to the final pixels to, to be displayed on the set and then sent to editing. The camera matrix, the in-camera matrix N, is different from M because we know ahead of time that we're going to post correct the whole image after the fact of capture with Q. So we're going to essentially make the in-camera background look wrong on purpose because we know we're going to correct it later. So to test out this approach, we captured seven different spectrally diverse lighting environments in the real world. Two were outdoors in the sun, one was in the shade, one was in the sun, and then five were indoors, including an incandescent scene, an indoor daylight scene, a warm white LED, an RGB-based LED that was creating white light, along with the sodium vapor lamp that has kind of one distinct uh, peak around 589 nanometers in its emission spectrum. Now, in order to display these within the somewhat limited dynamic range of a typical LED panel-based virtual production stage, we developed a light source dilation technique to reduce the dynamic range of HDRIs, um, which you can see the reference for here. It's going to be a poster at this year's SIGGRAPH, and you can see results um, for our scenes here as well. So we went out to take photographs of ourselves with our lighting reference spheres, our color chart, and our reference floral shirts, uh, one of which I'm wearing at present while I'm recording this video. So here's us outside in this daylight scene in a park. And then here we are inside an RGB virtual production stage where we're using the standard kind of baseline calibration technique where we're calibrating the stage to just make the background pixels look correct. And here, what we're looking at in the scene, besides the two subjects and our colorful clothing, we're looking both at a color chart that's being illuminated inside the virtual production stage, as well as a color chart that's been composited into the in-camera background so that we can evaluate the color rendition there as well. And I'll flip between this image and the previous one, and you can see the color differences, particularly for Paul's shirt on the left. In the next stage of our process, we're going to now post correct the shot with matrix Q. And now the idea is that the real color chart should match the original scene. And if I flip between this and the non-corrected version, you can see a large color difference. Now, next we're going to inverse correct the background pixels with our matrix N as in norm. And if I flip between this and the previous one, you can see the background changes slightly. And then finally, we're also going to apply a black level subtraction to the in-camera content behind the subjects because unfortunately the light that's falling on the, act on the actors, the subjects here, is also reflecting off the LED panels which have substantial reflectivity themselves. And now I'm going to flip between this photo, which is kind of our full process, and the real outdoor photograph. And although we haven't matched the background perspective exactly, the color rendition is generally believable. And so to summarize, now we can look at the full process. 
So the original outdoor scene is in the upper left. And next you can see the baseline calibration approach if you just drive the LEDs to make the background pixels look correct. We see substantial color rendition errors here for the foreground subjects. Next, we can post correct the full image with Q, which fixes some of those foreground color rendition issues. And then in the second row now, we can inverse correct the camera background with the matrix N as in norm, and then finally apply our black level subtraction. We do see here a dramatic effect that the new workflow has on the foreground color rendition, and also a large effect of the black level subtraction for the in-camera appearance. So here's another example for one of our other lighting environments with the original scene in the upper left, the baseline calibration approach in the middle of the top row, and then our full technique in the lower right with the intermediate steps in between. And although I'm not gonna show all the results for the seven different lighting environments, you can come to the DigiPro talk for that, I will show the result for the sodium vapor light because it really demonstrates the technique at its fullest. So here in the upper left corner again is the original scene. And you can see here that the unique spectrum of the sodium vapor light source makes the scene look almost monochromatic to our camera. Now when we drive the virtual production stage to try to make the background look correct, we see, yes, we largely can make the background colors match. However, an RGB LED virtual production stage that's trying its best to make yellow light is going to end up mixing together the red and the green LEDs, which are broader in spectrum than the original sodium vapor light. And so we now see colors emerging. You see that in the middle of the second of the top row. Now our post-production technique here enables completely desaturating these colors towards the monochromatic look. But unfortunately, in this case, the post-correction matrix Q is poorly conditioned. And so we're actually unable to invert it to apply the inverse on the background. So we've seen at this point that we can ameliorate some of the color rendition challenges that come with using RGB LEDs. And so this begs the question, can we just use RGB LED panels after all, after all that? And the answer we think is probably not. There are still color rendition errors that are visible on set to the eye. There are still color rendition errors in camera for certain color materials, uh, materials with specific reflectance spectra. It's also challenging to make bright light sources inside virtual production stages that have um, hard shadows. And it's also difficult to make spatially varying lighting. Also, cinematographers are often looking to intermix virtual production with broad spectrum studio lighting, which leads to its own unique set of difficulties. And then finally, the black level challenges due to panel reflectivity are a real problem that needs to be addressed. So on this note, um, I wanna thank all of our collaborators over the years for their dedication. I wanna thank the virtual audience for watching. I hope that we've all left today with an appreciation of the, the spectrum of lighting that we're going to be using to illuminate actors inside our virtual production stages. And uh, cheers, and hopefully we have a lively conversation in the live roundtable version of this talk. Thank you.